Manu Wei. He started as a, he started out by selling tailor made shirts from China to Europe using a badly folded paper tin bag. Then he continued to run a web design and consulting agency before getting involved with open source projects by Debian and Bob Becker. Currently lives in Kuala Lumpur and run a Bob base, runs BobBase.com, a backup hosting based on Bob Becker, Bego, and Vue.js. This talk, the title is Acting a GraphQL API to Django with Vue.js front end. This talk is aimed at Python web developers. First, to introduce the GraphQL syntax and differences with web. Next, the, uh, we are going to build a simple Django backend with a Vue.js front end. In the process, we'll learn how to effectively map Django model to GraphQL and add authentication and test to the new API. I'll pass the floor to the first one. Thanks for the introduction. And welcome everyone to my talk. Um, I want to start off with a little survey so I, I know where to put my focus. So who here is developing with Django? Okay, so like a like little bit less than half. And who is working with GraphQL? One, two, three, two. Okay, not so many. Okay, so I'll try to enlighten the Django developers and introduce them a little bit to GraphQL. That's all. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about me. Most stuff was already introduction. I ended up in Asia by studying business and selling tailor-made shirts online, which didn't work out well because people there, they're not very good at measuring themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, then last year I've been working on my own startup, which is called Workbase. Um, it uses a Python backup tool. So it provides hosting for this Python backup tool. So if you need a backup, if you don't have a backup yet, you can look into that. Um, then I mostly work with Python, Django, some Go, and some and Vue.js in the front end. Um, then some open source projects that I maintain at the moment. One is Invoice to Data, which I talked about last year. <laughs> he was there, yeah. <laughs> it's still go, it's still going strong. I like it. Um, but I haven't found a way to like extend and maybe commercialize it. So I'm still looking into that. Maybe I'll talk about uh, I'll talk more about it next year. Um, and then the second project that I added since last year is Vorta, which is a backup desktop client. So you can run you can run it in a desktop as a like little icon, and it will do backups. And you have like a graphical user interface to work. Um, so as is, um, the goal of this talk is to like help Django developers to s to help them with the decision if they should use. REST or GraphQL for the next project. So that's my main goal. And we will, the talk will have a few parts. So first I will compare REST and GraphQL, like very high level. Then we will look at the, at the, like the syntax level, which kinds of objects and stuff GraphQL has and how they compare with REST and how they play into Django. Then I have quite a lot of examples. I have, I have a, I have two repositories, one is for the backend, one is for the front end. So anyone who wants to play with it, they can just download it and make some changes and it will work straight away. Um, then we have a, a front end example in Future.js. Future.js because it's very simple to get started as well and very readable. Um, then I have added some new slides about authentication and security and about permission management, which I didn't have some previous talk. And then there will be a summary and then we'll have some time for discussions and you can ask me if your project should use GraphQL or not, this kind of stuff. Um, so REST, so if someone comes up with a new framework or language, it usually means they have a problem with the current way of doing things. So what are the problems that people have with REST? Um, so REST is based on like HTTP, so Basically, you, you have an endpoint, which is like an URL, and then you have different HTTP calls, like get, post, put, delete, patch, and all this kind of stuff. And within your application, 
you need to map the stuff that you do in your application, you need to map it to those HTTP commands, which can be a challenge because how do you know if it's put or patch or maybe it's somewhere in between or maybe it's something totally different. So when I started out a few years ago and I, when I built my first larger web application, I just did post and JSON all the time because we just needed a way to pass some arguments. People do similar stuff with, I think, JSON, RPC or something, which is a similar idea. So this has been there before. Um, then the next problem is probably the main reason why Facebook started using GraphQL or why they came up with it. Because in, in, a, in a more complex web application, you have a, usually one endpoint is not isolated, but you have relationships like a, like a blog post has an author, then the author has maybe friends or whatever. So you always have connected objects. That's why it's called GraphQL. Graph means like stuff is connected. And GraphQL was an attempt to, to make it easier to model these relationships and to, to query them. Because usually you don't just want the author, maybe you want the number of likes he has, the number of followers he has, all these kinds of stuff. Um, then one more problem is with REST is every request is like one HTTP request which can which can take some time. So um, so GraphQL has the advantage that it's just one endpoint. You make one request and you can get data from many many different objects. So that makes it a lot a lot faster. Uh, last issue with REST is over and under fetching. So um, with REST, when you query an endpoint by an ID, usually it gives you like all the fields and it's very hard to filter stuff. There are some ways to do it, but it's not built into the specification really. Okay, so here is a, here's a nice graphic that I pulled from a nice tutorial that I recommend. It's called How to GraphQL. And it shows the, like the life cycle of a, of a HTTP request. So this is, this is how we would do it in a classic REST application. So, for example, we want to populate, a, like this could be, this could be a, a blog or like a Twitter-like service. So first we make a request to get the user, we get him by ID, so we get the name and the date of birth, maybe to display it in a, in a web interface. Then next we want to display the, the posts that this user has done. So we get the title of the, of the post and the content and the text and all this kind of stuff. And then maybe we want to show how many followers he has, how many friends. So we do another request. So now we have already made three requests and maybe we don't even need all this data. Maybe we don't need the content of the post. Maybe we only need the title. So this, this is an issue. Um, then here in comparison how GraphQL would do it, roughly the same thing. So there's only one request, one post request we would post this query here. We will talk about this more in the next few slides, but for now, just, just trust me that this is a GraphQL query. And then you would get, um, so basically you would query the user by ID, again, same as what we did here. So we are asking for this ID, but then at the same time, we are asking the server to give us also the post, but we only want the title. So we, we will only get the title. We don't get the content, which may be very large, right? If we don't, if we only care about the title and we throw the, the content text away, we, we can tell it we just need the title. And then the followers, maybe we want to show the last three guys who followed our author, so it will give us the last few, um, few followers. So as you can see, the, the difference is I can solve most of these problems. So the underfetching I can solve, um, because I can say I only need the last three or I only need this and this field. Then the relationship, I can model the relationship, which means I can have the post, the followers and everything. It's all connected and it's, it's all coming in a, in a nice structure. And also, I don't need to think about this stuff. I don't need to think about guest post, patch and everything. And it's only one request, so it's three times faster. Um, okay, yeah. now we're looking, this is like an introduction to the syntax. So the first, um, the first structure of GraphQL that you should be familiar with is the type, which is roughly like a Django model or like an, like an object 
um, or like a class, could be like a class, yeah. So for example, I would have the class of post and the class has some attributes like the title and the author. And as you can see, I can have some, there are some primitive types like a string or an integer or a boolean or everything. And there, I can also use more complex types. So I can reuse types on other objects. Um, here's another one, it could also be a list of, of other types. Um, we'll see this later in Django, how the model, um, like when I have a foreign key, it will automatically model a set on another object. So this maps very nicely. Um, then the second concept that's important is a, is a query, or maybe it's better to call it operation. So basically you can do um, to get data in GraphQL, you can do two kinds of operations. Um, one is a query, one is a mutation. So the query just gives you data, the mutation changes data. So only two, two kinds of things, changing and, and getting stuff. Um, the default type is a query. So if I don't write anything, it will assume it's a query. And then all I need to give is the, is the query name and the fields that I want, maybe. I don't need to give any variables. Um, here's a little bit more um, a detailed breakdown of how the different components of a, of a GraphQL operation are named. So we have the query type, which can be a mutation or a query. Then we have the query name, um, which would be similar to an endpoint in REST. Then we can have variables um, that we can reuse later or multiple times. And then we, we can, um, we tell it which fields we want to get. Here's an example of a mutation. So the mutation, you have to explicitly um, mention the keyword that you wanna do a mutation. For example, if I want to create an object, I call it create person, I give it the name, the age, and then I run this mutation. And I, I tell it that I want to get back the ID, which is a very common requirement. Maybe you wanna, add it to a list later, or you want to delete it at a later point. So you need to get the ID of the backend. So we, s we, we already know the name and the age. So we ask it to give back the ID, and then this is the response. So um, we get back the response of the create person mutation, and it will give us back the ID. Okay, then the next concept is argument. Arguments are mostly used to to parameterize um, predefined GraphQL um, query strings. Because usually in your application, you would keep your GraphQL queries as strings or as extra files. There are some tools, um, sometimes I get this question, so there are some tools that allow you to write the GraphQL as Python or as JavaScript directly, but that's not very common, so most people keep the GraphQL um, GraphQL operations, like the top part here, they keep this as extra string, and they, they parameterize it by, by using these variables here. So for example, I say, I'm doing a mutation, I give it a name, and I have two variables, and then in my JavaScript call, I will replace these variables, and then the, the GraphQL client will, will insert these variables for me. We will see this later in the example code. Um, then the next concept is nesting. We've already seen that before in the example. So for example, if I have a post, then the post has two attributes by itself, ID and title, and then it has a foreign key, like a connected object, like a foreign key in Django, which is offer, and then I can nest my stuff, and I can ask for attributes of a nested object. So I can ask for the ID and the name of the age of the offer that I'm, I'm querying for. And this is how it looks like. This is, the, this is the graph aspect, which is like really the main, one of the main benefits over REST. Um, then subscription, also very interesting. This is a little bit connected to the, to, la to the last talk because it doesn't work in Django yet without using the Tornado or one of the AW ASGI web servers. So you need to use a, a more modern and experimental web server if you want to use subscriptions. And it's a little bit, it's not really 
not really well supported at this moment. Um, so many people are using WebSocket separately instead of using a, a GraphQL subscription, but it's in the specification. Um, it's like a way for the client to get notified of new, of new things that happen on the server. And usually it's implemented with WebSockets, but it's not very well supported by most libraries. So mostly um, Apollo and Node.js, they support it very well. But for Graphene and in Python, um, last time I checked, it wasn't, it wasn't their priority to implement that. Um, then one more thing is fragments. Um, so I ran into this problem myself. For example, you have like five or six different GraphQL queries and you're always getting the same objects and your object has maybe 20 or 30 attributes and you don't want to repeat all these attributes in every query. So what you can do, you can have a fragment. And the fragment is like a list of attributes that, that you want to query on a field. It's a way to, to write less code. For example, if, you have, um, if I have my blog post and maybe I want to add a new field that's called like the, the day of the week it was created or whatever, <laughs> then I could just extend the fragment and I don't need to change all my individual GraphQL queries because all these GraphQL queries, they would all just use the fragment. Okay, now demo time. Um, let's jump into the code. Okay, so I set up a very simple um, Django application here. So I guess every, most people will, so everyone who's coding Django will be familiar with this. So I have my, my site here with some settings. Then I have one app. Um, and usually I start with the models. So I have two models here. Um, I'm reusing the example from how to graph QL here. So I made two, two models, one person and one for the post, like author and, and blog post. And I added name and age, like a, just a character field and an integer field. And for the post, I added title and I added a foreign key. So we have a nice connected object, like a nice graph. Um, Oh, here we go. Okay, so we have the model here. And let's see how this connects to GraphQL. So I have my model here. Then this is a new file. If, you, uh, if you're not using GraphQL yet with Django, you probably don't have this. Um, so schema is the place where you would connect your, your Django application to the, to the GraphQL library. So the first step is to define the types. As we learned earlier, um, types are like the classes of GraphQL. So for every Django model that we have, we need to map it to a type of GraphQL, which is almost the same. And you only need three lines to do this. So usually you just append the word type. So to make it sure it's a, <laughs> it's a type of GraphQL. And then you just tell it that you want to use the Django model called person. And here's the same for post. So that's really it. And with this, you can already do a lot of stuff. Um, then the second part is to define some queries. As we learned, queries are, are a way to like pull data out of the out of the back end, but but without changing it. So here I defined two queries. Um, also very simple. It's just all persons and all posts. So these queries, what they do is they just return all the posts I have, and they return all the all the all the offers and all the persons that I have in my, in my database. And then as a final step, I define some mutations. Um, the syntax to define this is a little bit different than, um, than for queries. So for queries, it's only one function, as we see here. Um, for mutations, you do one class per mutation, and you define the, the return like the return that it will give, and you define the argument, like the input argument that the mutation has. So here I have two mutations. 
One is the login mutation, which accepts two arguments, the username and the password. And then I have a little function to, um, to lock the user in. And then I have a second mutation to create a person. Um, it creates, it, it accepts, uh, I mean, it returns a new, a new type of person and it accepts name and age, which are the required attributes for a person. Let's go back here. Okay, so that's for the front end. I have the front end running now, like in IntelliJ. So now we can try to, um, to query this. Um, so this is graph IQL. This is like a little, um, it's like a documentation slash explorer slash development, not a development environment, but like it helps you to play around with your GraphQL API. Um, so it's like an automatic documentation. So for example, when you, when you open here the thing on the, on the right, it will show you a list of queries that you can do. It will show you the types. It will show you the fields that these types are having. It will show you the mutation that you can do. It will show you what kind of arguments you need to pass to your mutations so they are working. So this is like, and this is automatically generated. So you don't need to do anything to, um, to get this kind of documentation. You just write the code in Django and then you get all this documentation here for free. And now we can try a few, um, a few queries just for fun and to, to see that our, our backend is working. So for example, here we have a query. As I said, if it's a query, I can, I can, stip, I can skip the keyword, but we can still write it here. Um, so it's a query. I don't give this query another name. Then I run the query all persons, which we wrote in, in, in Django before. And I want to get the name, the ID and the name of all the authors. And then you run it, and then you get this result again <laughs> um, with all the, all the objects that I already have in my Django. Um, let's try a few others. So for example, I could do, um, I could ask it for all the posts. For example, my blog has a couple of posts. And here I will ask it for the ID of the post, the title, the author, and the name. This is like a nested query that we saw before. And here I only have one post with the title, my GraphQL stuff, author is Lisa. Yep. Um, yeah, I think that's enough to make sure it's working. Now let's look at the, at the JavaScript side. Anyone using Vue.js? React? Yeah. <laughs> React, okay. <laughs> um, it will be similar, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so just a word about JavaScript clients. So when Facebook originally open sourced this, they also open sourced the reference implementation called Relay. Um, it's not widely used, I think, just mention it here. Then I think the most famous one and the company that's pushing that a lot is Apollo. They're having a, a very popular and complex front end client and they have a Node.js backend library as well. And then you have a, a bunch of more minimal JavaScript client libraries, one of them which I'll be using for here because it's so easy to set up. But for a, for a more complex project, you probably want to go with Apollo. For a small toy project, you can use one of the smaller libraries as well. Um, okay, let's change to JavaScript. Okay, this is quite a small application, so we can fit it all in one Vue.js component. Um, maybe let's look at the result first before diving into the code. Okay, so we have, I just put all the fields <laughs> on the same page. Um, so we have one button that will pull all the, all the authors, all the persons that we have in our database. Then we have another form that will log us in. And then we have another form that allows us to add a new person to our database. So let's look at how it looks in code. So here we have list all persons. This is a query that will list all the persons in the database. And that it will, then it will just 
list the ID, the name, and the age. Then here we have the login form, which takes a username, password, and the login button, and it will do a mutation to log us in on the server. And then we have the add person mutation, which adds a new person. Um, let's look at the query first, because it's the most simple. Um, so this runs the function get persons. Let's see how this looks down here. So here we have our GraphQL query. As I said, this is written as a, as a string, but you could also do it more ORM style and build it directly in JavaScript, but I don't see that very often. Um, then here we have our GraphQL client, which we initialized with, our, with the endpoint. So there's only one endpoint, which is running on my local computer. Um, but even in production, you just need to change the, the domain. So there's only so you don't need to deal with multiple URLs or, or endpoints. Um, so we do the request, and then we just um, we have the all persons query. We just unpack it in JavaScript, and we assign it to the to, the, to this reactive Vue.js attribute, and then it should display on our website. Let's see if it works. Um, we can actually look at the network. This one here to see how stuff looks there. Okay, so we press the button and this will query the GraphQL API. We see it made a, a call to the to GraphQL. Um, a little bit small. I think my screen is too small. But it's okay. Um, Anything interesting here? Yeah, so as you see, um, it made a, a post request. Um, it's asking for, with, it, it's, it made a post request with a body type of JSON because every GraphQL query is a JSON. Um, and then it got some more JSON back. That's pretty much it. Yeah, this doesn't look great. Oh, Okay, I'll stop this now. <laughs> but we see it worked, so we made a request and we got a list of, of stuff back. And this is the same, the same list of, the same list we get back here. So if we do the same request here, um, all persons. So we get exactly this same list here. We just use Vue.js to render it. Um, then let's try some more. Functions. So next we have the the login. Yeah, let's try the yeah let's try the login function. Um, because you also want to you probably want to secure your GraphQL library because some um, yeah. So what's the problem with GraphQL compared to REST when it comes to authentication? So with REST you can protect your endpoints because you have many different URLs or endpoints. So you can protect them one by one and you can do permissions. On a, on a URL or endpoint level. With GraphQL, you always have the same endpoint, so you have to do it some other way. Um, so there are two ways of doing it. I'll talk about both of them. The first one is to, um, like to, um, to use a login decorator, which you know from Django probably, login decorator, like that you only r run a certain view if the user is logged in, for example. So this is what you can do. But it's not very granular because it, it's only zero and one, logged in or not logged in. So um, for GraphQL, an alternative is to do it by to do it by by operation type and by operation um, name. So if we go back to um, to one of the previous slides, this one here. So we have the operation type and the operation name, and this is what I would recommend to do. Um, for permission management in GraphQL. So instead of doing it by endpoint, you do it by operation type and operation name. So query, as we say, query will on only display data. So if you have a blog, everyone can display the blog posts, but nobody can add blog posts because this would be a, a mutation to change data. So that's already quite a nice way to, 
to change permissions or to control permissions. Then we have the operation name, which is even more granular. For example, you could have some roles that are only allowed to, um, to, to do certain operations. Let's see how this would look in, in Python code. Um, so this is roughly how, how, it, how it would look like. Um, so this is, um, this would be a, a login decorator function or a permission decorator function that I would put on, on every single, um, on every single GraphQL function. Um, we would go back here, where do we have it? Mutate. So this would go here. So I already made a, a little utility function. Where is it? Authentication. Go login. Okay, here I'm just I'm just using the the default login decorator, which is enough. Okay, so, so this code would, 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 this would run inside a custom login decorator function. So every, when you're using GraphQL in Django, you're getting a, an additional, um, like an additional input, like the same for, for Django views, you will, you will get the request object to know about the user who is doing the request, the session, some additional details. And for GraphQL, it gives you even more stuff. It gives you the, like the HTTP headers, which you also get in normal, but it will also give you some information about the, the GraphQL query that's running at the moment. And this is what I'm using here. Um, just wanna go back there. Okay, so this part here. So we have a mutation function, and the first argument that we're getting is the info object, which has a lot of extra details about the GraphQL request. And the rest is extra arguments that are specific to our GraphQL query. So I'm using this info object here to pull out the, the GraphQL operation that we're doing at the moment. GraphQL operation could be like get person or create person, create post or something like that. Um, and then I have a very simple dictionary that says like allowed types or allowed operations or allowed operation name or whatever. Um, and then I'm checking if the current operation is in, is, in, is in this dictionary or is in this list of allowed types. And then if it's not in the dictionary, I'm just returning an error that the user doesn't have permission. And this is like a very simple way to, um, to control permissions in GraphQL. Um, as we said, you have the operation type, which is a mutation or a query. Then you have the name of the current query, which is in info.path. Um, and then one third thing that's useful, but it cannot be done with a login decorator, it needs to be done with a resolver, um, would be the list of affected types. Because keep in mind, um, for example, you want some users to, to be unable to read certain types, for example, you don't want someone to read the field um, of age, for example, or you don't want to get the list of followers that are connected. You don't want to get their details. Um, so you would need to have to filter at the level of affected models or affected types. So for this, you need to do some, some, some additional work in the resolver function. But if you only want to filter for the operation and the operation name, then you can just use a login decorator like always. Okay, then a short summary. Um, so why do we use GraphQL? Because it solves a, pro a couple of problems with REST, which are like um, fetching too much data or too little data and fetching connected or nested objects. And it also minimizes the, the number of HTTP calls that we need. Um, then the GraphQL schema, it's unfortunately, it's 
it's a, almost like a new language, but it's not too complicated. We have types, then we have operations. Operation can be a query or a mutation. Um, then we have name of operations, and then we have um, we can have fragments and and connected fields, which is pretty much all. Um, then implementations. There are many many implementations of this. For Django, um, the currently like the most mature one is Graphene, um, but I was told there are others that are also around now, but I didn't look into them in detail. Um, for JavaScript, Apollo is the, the most powerful one, um, but for smaller projects, you can also look into, into simpler ones. Um, and same as with the last talk, with the previous talk, um, you can reuse all the stuff that you already know in Django. You can use the ORM, you can use sessions um, I was just so I was just reusing a session cookies in my login function so I didn't do anything extra and GraphQL doesn't specify um, how you should do authentication at all so you can just reuse all of that um, you can use the login decorator still so it's not a big change for Django developers I think um, so that's my talk um, for my for slides and for GitHub repositories to the sample code, you can check out this URL or you can write me on Twitter. Okay, questions? Thank you. Yes, um, luckily you only have to do it once and then you just plug in the variable. <laughs> um, no, I really write the query once and and then usually I only change it when I have to. So I use fragments so I don't have to touch the, the query too often and I use variables as often as I can. So if you like parameterize it to different spaces, like concatenate it, um, it gets more complicated. Um, pagination, I'm not using at the moment, but ah. there are some, um, no, there's some, I think a package, Graphene has an extension or a package that okay. gives you filters and pagination Perfect. out of the box. The drawback is, as I told Alex earlier, that it will force the relay style onto you. So yeah. you will have some stuff like nodes and edge and stuff in it. So you need to do some more work in your JavaScript front end. Um, but you can get it for free. Um, maybe someone made a package by now that doesn't use the relay format. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure there are many people in the room who have existing necessary legacy REST interfaces. Yeah. Do you have any tips for? So I have not done a migration myself because I started from a greenfield when I started. Um, but I think you can run both in parallel at the same time. And once you have replaced all your REST endpoints, you just turn off the like the URLs, the Django URLs that are using the Django REST framework. Um, this is another argument for GraphQL. I'm not sure if it's true, but um, often you hear that you don't need versioning for GraphQL because the client decides which fields to fetch. And if the client doesn't ask for the fields, then it just doesn't get returned. And for example, if you're adding new fields, like in most cases you will add new fields, not remove them. Um, so if you add new fields, the newer clients can ask for the new fields and the old clients, they still get the same data as before. So I think migration is a little bit easier. I'm not sure if I would say that you don't need versioning at all, um, but probably you need it less. Yeah. 
it will not make your, if you have bad queries, it will not help you. <laughs> so you still need to, need to optimize your queries if you really have complicated queries. Um, but it does help you with underlying overfetching. Um, so for example, if you have a REST endpoint that's not very flexible, and it will always fetch all your related objects. So GraphQL can help you in one sense that um, the client, if it doesn't need the connected fields, it just doesn't ask for it, and then Django will not query for them. So the client decides if, if he's willing to wait for the expensive query, if it's really that expensive. Um, if you have a lot of foreign keys and you want all the foreign keys, then you need to mention all the foreign keys, of course. But you can use a fragment to only write it once. Um, so to give an example, um, if you have the, um, like for board base for my project, I have the user object and the user object has a lot of connected stuff. For example, list of backup repositories, list of encryption keys and everything. Um, if you need those objects, um, usually I just say I need the encryption keys and then I pass on the fragment. So I work a lot with fragments, so I don't need to repeat this stuff. So you don't get, if you don't use fragments, you will get a long list because you have to mention the field, all the fields of your original field and then all the fields of your um, related fields that you, that you want. This was the question, right? Yeah, so fragments are the answer to that. If we go back a little bit, um, fragments, here we go. So these are fragments, so you just define a fragment and then you don't need to repeat this stuff here. So you can just add it to any query. For example, um, if you're looking for users, you just say you want the address details or if you have a connect, this also works for connected or nested fields. If you querying like 10 connected fields, then you can just pass the fragment and you get all the data. So you still have a rather short, short query. Uh, is this fragment work same as a Django REST framework to utilize it? Um, I didn't work a lot with Django REST, so I don't know. But this is at the GraphQL level. This is not at the Django level. So I would say no. Um, where are fragments? Yeah. No, this is. Um, I don't think it's it's similar. Oh, this no. is a this is a um, this is a feature of the GraphQL language. Oh, it's right. not a feature of Django. So uh, the situation is let's say sometimes we need to query the depth of uh, whatever data we are getting, so we need to go to the nested table. But we don't want to get the whole data from the nested uh, nested table, so we want to limit that data. Yeah. So for that. In uh, REST API, we create a serializer, and then we plug that serializer in that field. Uh, you don't need that for GraphQL. As I said, in GraphQL, you define which fields you want, and it will only give you those fields. Right. So you don't have this problem at all in GraphQL. So you don't need the need the serializer or anything. Right. That's the small thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think there might be. Thank you very much.